Amen. And so this morning, um, we're just happy and glad to be in the house of the Lord once more, one more time. And we're glad that we have competent and capable men to bring the word to us who are in touch with the anointing. So why don't you put your hands together and welcome our very own brother Jerry in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Bless you. Hallelujah. Can you all hear me? Great stuff. Excellent. Yes, I can say on behalf of my wife, you know, she has, um, you know, really sung the praises of the people who have, who have helped with the, with the meals and things like that. And it's a reminder that we can never do anything on our own. You know, we, we always need lots of people around us. And um, I'm pleased to say that that's how this church works. So, um, and I'd encourage more of you to join in. You know, don't think, oh, that's been taken care of. Look, always come in and, and whatever you can offer, then please do. Um, we would encourage that, you know. So, uh, thank you all for, for helping her. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning I want to speak about Haggai. Let's turn to Haggai chapter 1. That's in the Old Testament, near the end, if you've got a, a paper Bible. A real Bible, I was going to say, but. And we're going to read from chapter 1, Haggai chapter 1. And uh, give me a shout when you've found it, if you're looking for it. And this morning I want to challenge us all as a church. Um, you know, what are we investing in? And, you know, what are we, what are we really building in our own lives and in our lives corporately as a, as a fellowship, you know. So if you found Haggai chapter 1, you all got it? All right then. I'm going to read from verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not yet come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came to, or by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in a little you eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and on the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And you pray. You know, you open your heart and your mind and your mouth to the Lord. You pray. You ask the Lord to speak to you today, to challenge you, and to encourage you. Hallelujah. Lord and Father, we need you to speak to us. Just as we read there that the word of the Lord came by the prophet. We pray, Lord, that you would speak through me today. Not my word, but your word. That, Lord, your message would go out. And your word would, would be implanted in the hearts and minds of everybody in here and everybody who, who listens online. Lord and Father, we pray, Lord, that you would challenge and rebuke, but also encourage and strengthen. And that, Lord Jesus, we would resolve to, to follow the path that you have set upon us. Lord, we would indeed answer your call to consider our ways. So often we set on a certain course, we've made a certain decision, we have a certain strategy or tactic in our lives, but maybe we should reconsider. Maybe it's time to change. But Lord, above all, help us, Lord, to put it into action. That, Lord, our lives would be truly different. Not just that we would acknowledge something intellectually, but, Lord, in our hearts, we would change as people. 
and we would become the people that you desire, that we would become the church that you desire. And we pray, Lord, that you would do a new thing. And we ask it in your precious name, the name of Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. praise the Lord. Okay, historical background a little bit, just to understand what's going on here. This is after the exile. Now, the people of Israel were taken into exile because they sinned against God. They had a covenant in which they agreed to live by God's laws and to build a temple and to worship him. And they didn't do it. And so God took them into exile and said, look, you know, you have to learn. And then he brought them back and he told them to rebuild the temple and the... Uh, the kings of the Gentile nations at that time had, had given them a decree and, and told them that they could rebuild their temple, had even financed it, supported them. And they, they'd had trouble for, for many years, you know, they'd had opposition, people who didn't want it rebuilt. It was very similar to the situation that you see in, in Israel today. It was almost the same history repeating itself, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the, the time came when they actually had another fresh decree from, from the king, from the emperor at that time, uh, to rebuild the temple. And yet, amongst the people themselves, there was a lack of response. It seemed that they were concerned with building their own houses, as he describes them here, panelled houses lined with cedar. They must have been quite luxurious. But at the same time, they were neglecting the temple of the Lord. Now, of course, we as Christians, we're not concerned about a building in Jerusalem. We're not looking for that. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, when we were preaching, we were learning that Jesus is the temple. And indeed, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You can read that in Corinthians. You can read it in John's Gospel. And it's a great teaching. And this is the temple that we really need to think about. This is what we really need to think about, is our relationship with God. And we need to think about the church corporately as well. And the question is, what do we prioritize? What do we put most of our time into? What do we put most of our effort into? What do we invest our money into? Because the thing is that sometimes we can, we can put things in the wrong order. We can get the wrong priorities. It's very interesting looking at the history behind Haggai, because this is at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah and, uh, you know, Zephaniah and, and Zechariah, I should say. And there was various things going on in the background. When you read Ezra and Nehemiah, it's very interesting that they came back to Jerusalem, and the first thing they did was build a temple. Now, I find that very interesting. In fact, the very first thing they did was build an altar. And I find that very interesting because they were in a hostile environment. They had enemies all around. And I know that my priority would be to build the walls and get some weapons together. I'd say, look, we'll build the temple after we've built the walls. Let's get safe first. Safety first, you know. Let's build defenses. Let's build a castle or whatever else. Let's get the weapons. Let's get the men trained so that they can fight a battle or whatever else. And then when we've got everything safe, then we'll take care of things like the temple. But they didn't. They put the temple first. In fact, they put the altar first. And why is that? Because the first priority is being right with God. It's no good running on ahead and dealing with other things instead of dealing with your relationship with God first. That is the need that we have. You know, that is the need. You know how there are things which are wants and there are things which are needs. And we often get mixed up. We often get mixed up. I think it's very interesting. When I was a secondary school teacher... Uh, I did a little experiment with, with wants and needs, and I said, right, okay, uh, you're going to be landed on a deserted island or an airplane crash or whatever else. What are the things that you need? And most of the kids put iPhone at the top of the list. Uh, no, water, <laughs> some clothing, some heat maybe, you know. No, iPhone. And I think that maybe we can be exactly the same. We can see it very clearly in children doing that, but sometimes we can be the same. We need to realize as Christians that our number one priority is our relationship with God. But tell me something. What do we prioritize on in our own lives? What do we spend most time on? What do we invest in? It's very interesting, actually. If you were to make a list of all the important people in your life, who would you put at the top? 
Of course we'd all put God, wouldn't we? And then our wife and children or husband and children and then our friends, then our workmen or people that we work with, colleagues. And we'd have a list like that. But you ask yourself, how much time do you spend with God compared to the people that you work with? You give nearly half of your day to your work colleagues. You might give an hour or two to your wife and children. How much time do we give to God? It's interesting, isn't it? Because by rights, the most important people should have the most time, surely. And yet, actually, the most important people actually end up with the least amount of time. And the less important people end up with the lion's share of our hours during the day. Interesting thought, isn't it? And it's a question of our priorities. You know, what are we actually building? What are we actually investing in? What are we actually putting into practice? Because we say one thing, but we do another. And it's, it's quite a challenge, isn't it, when you actually think about that kind of stuff. See, I think it's also interesting that we see in Jesus an example of somebody who's perfect. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but in Mark 1, uh, it's very interesting. In Mark 1, he gets up on a Sabbath morning and he goes to the synagogue and he's teaching and, and he performs a couple of miracles and then he comes home and he goes to Peter's house and his mother-in-law, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, is, is sick. Jesus heals her, you know. And then it says, after sundown, the whole town was at the gate, uh, at the door, right? Okay, so he's been awake, you know, for the whole day and now it's sundown. The people come because it's the end of the Sabbath. They wouldn't go until the Sabbath was over, right? And the whole town was there. Now, we don't know how big the town was, but if it was Capernaum, then there was a few hundred people at the door, right? If he spent just five minutes with each person, how long do you think it took him to get through 600 people? In other words, Jesus was there all night. And then it says, early in the morning... Jesus got up and went to pray. Now, I don't think it means he got up out of bed because he never had a chance to get to bed. He got up from where he was sitting. The disciples had gone to bed because they woke up and he was gone. Now, I want to ask you something. He's just had a 24-hour day. And he's been busy during that day. He's not been lazing around. Jesus has had a 24-hour day. Where would my priority be? Where would your priority be at that point? Bed. Sleep. I'm gone. Where was the Lord's priority? Prayer. And I think it's interesting that, you know, our priorities are often driven by physical needs. If we're hungry, if we're tired. But yet, the Lord's priorities were driven by his spirit, his spiritual needs. I know that maybe we can't measure up to that, because he's perfect. But don't ever let that be an excuse to, oh, well, I can't measure up. We should try. Jesus did say, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect. We should strive for perfection as Christians, shouldn't we? But it's interesting when, you know, every day we make decisions that show where our priorities really are. Now, we can say God is the most important person in our lives, but what do our decisions say? Not what do our words say, but what do our actions say? Because actions do speak louder than words, do they not? And it's a real challenge. And I'm not here to point the finger at anybody because this is where God has been challenging me. Look at you. <laughs> you can get plenty of time to sleep, you can get plenty of time to, to watch silly videos on YouTube, but you can't get enough time to read your Bible or to pray. Where are you at, Jerry? You know, and God has challenged me. You know, and it, it's one of those things whereby we all probably struggle, if we're honest, because none of us are perfect. But don't let that be an excuse. Grace is not a license to just follow the flesh. Okay, And the thing is that we should actually challenge ourselves and admit and confess, I fall short, but I need to improve. Nor am I calling people to suddenly leap to perfection. 
I think it's also the case that we can, uh, you know, just take incremental steps. If you're struggling to pray, maybe you're praying for a minute a day. Well, try and make it a minute and a half tomorrow. Don't try to make it five hours, because you can't do it. Just incremental steps. But the thing is, Jesus, you know, gives us a perfect example of what we should be aiming for. And we see in Haggai, he says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. And that's the call this morning, to consider, to think. To think, I could do better. I want to be a good Christian. We want to be a good church. You know, it's not for me to, to browbeat people to go to meetings. But I would encourage you to go to meetings. I myself, I missed deeper worship this week, unfortunately. But by and large, I try to make the effort to get to meetings. So often people will say, oh, the church should be stronger. How many of us were in the prayer meeting? Oh, the church should know more about the Bible. How many of us are at the Bible study? At the end of the day, we will reap what we sow. Depends where we invest. Depends where we invest. It is very much a, a corporate thing as well. Unfortunately, many of us take a sort of consumer attitude towards the church. Do you know what I mean by that? You go to the church that gives you what you want. Just like we go to restaurants. Don't like the food in that restaurant. Like that restaurant. Good value for money. I'm going to go there. And so we go to the restaurant that we like. And that's unfortunately one of the effects, I think, with uh, modern transport. People don't have to go to the local church. They can choose to go to a church that's further away that gives them what they want. And then churches sometimes have to be consumer orientated because otherwise they lose numbers. You think, is that really how the kingdom's supposed to work? No, it's not. We should go to a church that gives us what we need rather than what we want. And we should also go to a church where we can give something rather than what we get. Do you understand the difference? Too many people, they think about what, you know, they, 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 I don't get anything out of the worship there. I don't like the music. Do you realize that you're not supposed to get anything out of the worship? Because the worship is not for you. Who is the worship for? God. The question is, does God get anything out of the worship? We're supposed to put into the worship. There's the thing, you see. So we should think about, you know, can we give to the worship? You know, which church do we go to? Look, okay, I'm a musician. I like it in this church because there's good music. It's great. It's excellent. But maybe I'd be of better use in a church where they had no musicians at all. Because there, I could help them worship God. Food for thought. Too many of us, we go to a church where we want to get something instead of give. You know something? I've been a minister for many years. I'm used to preaching three or four times a week. And when I came here, of course, I was not a minister. I just came in as a member of the congregation. What should I do? Should I sit around and criticize and complain about things or whatever else? Or should I look for an opportunity to serve? I looked around and thought, well, I'm not preaching and I'm not leading and I'm not, you know, uh, operating in the, in the leadership of the church. Does that mean I should just sit there with my arms folded? No, I looked around. I looked around for a job. Oh, they needed people on the media. I can point a camera. I can do that. So I did that. Oh, they need musicians. Right, well, I can play the guitar. I can help with the worship. And the thing is, you look for an opportunity to give. It wasn't about what I got from this church that drew me here. I came here specifically because I believe the Lord drew me here. But what I was interested in is what can I give? And the question is, how do you operate? How do you think? When you come to the church, do you think about what you get from the church or do you think about what you could give to the church? Do you think about what offering you can bring? After all, thinking of the temple, 
People would go to the temple with an offering. It was about what you took to the temple. Not what you got. You bought a sacrifice. And the question is, what do we sacrifice? Where do we make sacrifices in our lives? Where do we give our time? Where do we give our money? Where do we give our effort? Where do we make sacrifices? What do we give to the church? What do we give to other people in the church? What do we give to God? And this is the thing. This is what a temple is all about. This is what building a temple is all about. It's about what you offer, not what you get. You know, he says in verses 5 and 6, he says, look, you've, you've planted much but harvested little. How many of us feel dissatisfaction with our lives? How many of us wish that we had more of this or less of that or something else or, you know, who's been complaining about the rain the last few days? I've never known it so wet in Cambridge. But the crops are going to be fantastic. My wife keeps saying, you watch the garden in a few weeks. You know, the garden's going to be fantastic. And I think, like, oh, okay. Um, she likes gardening, I don't. <laughs> Please stop the rain. The thing is that actually... You know, we tend to, to complain that we're dissatisfied with our lives, not about the weather, but I mean about money in particular, that's a favorite, or health, aches and pains, we all have them. But the thing is, what we really should be thinking about is our spiritual lives. That's what really matters. That's all that matters. That's the only thing that really matters. That's our only need. I mentioned before about wants and needs. Often people misquote the scripture from, I think it's Hebrews, you know, that we have a high priest who meets our need. One need, singular. N-E-E-D, full stop. Not needs. It's not about God providing money or God providing things or God providing whatever else. It's about one need. And what is our one, one singular need that we have? Salvation. Salvation. That's the only thing we actually need. Everything else is a want. Everything else is a by the way. But sometimes we put that down on our priorities. Church gets the least. God gets the least. He gets the tail end of the day. You know, it's one of those things in terms of sacrifice. You know, I was taught from a, as, a, as a young Christian, always give the first to God. Give the first of your income to God. Give the first of your day to God. After a while, you know, I came to the conclusion that giving the first part of my day to God wasn't the best. Because when I get up, I'm like, <laughs> I need coffee. You know, and I'm like this. It's not a good time to pray. Because I'm really not with it. So actually, you know, we're not talking in terms of time talking in terms of the best. Give the best of your day to God. Give the best of your time to God. And then we will see a different harvest. Then we will see a different harvest. Now, this is not prosperity gospel type of stuff, right? Because the thing is, you could, you could sow financially, you could sow in many ways, but you could reap spiritually. You can still be poverty-stricken, but still be rich in God. You can still be overdrawn at the bank, but still be rich in God, spiritually strong and, and vibrant. And that's what really matters. Other things may come, other things may go. They don't matter. So I don't want this to come across, you know, I could, I could have gone to Malachi 3, where it talks about tithing, and he says, like, you know, if you will tithe properly, then God will open the floodgates of heaven. And it, it comes across very much, it, it's quite clearly saying, you know, you will prosper, your crops will grow, and stuff like that, which is great. But there's also other scriptures which speak of the fact that sometimes the poorest of people are the spiritually the wealthiest, like the poor widow, you know doesn't say that she became super rich after that, after she put her two copper coins in the offering. She had everything, she gave everything that she had, but she was spiritually blessed. God saw and God blessed her. And God will bless you as well. If you're dissatisfied with your life, perhaps it's because you're investing in the wrong things. 
You know, you can invest in your career, you can invest in your, your degree, your college, or your education, and still be very, very dissatisfied. I see lots and lots of people who have got the best of the best. They're driving around in a new car or whatever else, you know, and they're still miserable. Still miserable. Why? Because they've invested in the wrong things. But if you invest in Jesus, if you invest in your relationship with God, if you invest in the church, we will be greatly blessed. Because this is the temple of God, not this building. We're not interested in the building. The building, as long as it's watertight, that'll do. Right? This is the building of God. This is the body of Christ. And this is where we should be investing. That we should grow as a church, as Christians. That we should grow in the Lord and be a great blessing. Then that river I was talking about the other day will flow from us. Amen? You remember I was talking about Ezekiel 47? The river, what was the river? It was the Holy Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit to flow through us and out of us and from us and, and bless the whole world around us. Do we not? Do we not? Yeah? And the thing is that, that it's up to us. The responsibility is us. Consider your ways. The responsibility comes down to us because we decide... Yes, it's God who commands the blessing, but it's we who decide how much time we're going to spend reading our Bible, how much time we're going to spend praying, how much time we're going to spend visiting people in the church. You know, there's a world of opportunity out there, you know, for Christians. There are so many things we could be doing. The question is, are we, are we passive or are we active? You know, there are some people who are great critics. They're armchair critics. The church should be this. The church should be that. The church should be the other. Such and a body has been missing from church for six months and nobody's been to visit them. Somebody should go and visit them. Right? What about you? You see? And this is the thing. We're always on about what we get from a church instead of what we give to a church. If you've seen that somebody's missing, you go and encourage them. Don't go and grumble about the church. Go and encourage. Go and uplift. Go and strengthen. Bring them in. There is so much more that we can really spend with God. We could really worship God. There's a great blessing. There's a great banquet in front of us. You know, there's a great, um, there's an absolute smorgasbord of, of things that God has for us. The gifts, the fruit of the Spirit. The, the ministries, the, the opportunities, the, the just, it's just wonderful to know God, isn't it? And the thing is that sometimes we don't make the most of that. Listen, how much are you going to get out of Sunday worship if you don't pray, you don't read your Bible, and you don't spend time in fellowship in between times? Because you haven't put anything in, you won't get anything out. There is a principle of reaping and sowing. The greatest blessing I get is when I give something to somebody. If I come to church and I don't encourage anybody and I don't uplift anybody and I don't really talk to anybody, I don't have a, a good chat with somebody, I go away from church feeling... But if I come to church and I give and I give and I give and I give and I give, I go out absolutely on cloud nine. So many people will come to church, they'll sit in a chair... And then they walk out and say, I didn't get much out of that. Why not? It's common sense to some extent, but it's also the principle by which God works. And he goes on and he finishes in chapter 2 and verse 19. He says, from this day forward, I will bless you. But the decision is in the hands of the people. Consider your ways. Who's got to do it? You have. Change your ways. Who's got to do it? We have. And then God says, from this day forth, I will bless you. Do you want to be blessed by God? Well, the first thing you need to do is bless him and bless the people around you. Bless your neighbor. Fulfill all of the, the commands that God has for us to be everything that we should be. The decision is ours. He gives us the gifts. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us the wisdom. He gives us his word. He's given us everything. But it's only worthwhile if we go and put it into practice. 
And that decision is ultimately in our hands. You may say, but I lack the strength. Well, ask him. He will equip you. You may say, but I don't know much. I don't have the wisdom. Ask him. He will give you. Step out in faith. Start to do the things of God. Invest. Start to build the temple of God. This temple. Start to build your spiritual life. Build the church corporately. Don't just be a selfish little Christian or I'm going to get what I want, right? Be a giving Christian. And then the church as such will grow. This is the temple of God. The Holy Spirit dwells within. Wonderful things could happen. But it's up to us to put them into present. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord and Father, we are in your hands. We are your children. And we are here this morning to receive from you so that we can give to you. Lord, you have given us instruction this morning. You have given us encouragement. You have rebuked us and challenged us. But also you have encouraged us and uplifted us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have got good things for us. We thank you, Lord, that you've got good plans for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have good plans for us as individuals and as a church, as a fellowship. And we pray, Lord, that we would grow in you, that you would do something new in us, that we would do something new in you, that, Lord, we would step out in faith and really start to be the people that you want us to be. Lord, it's a very simple message this morning. But Lord, it's something that we really need to take to heart. We need to reconsider our priorities. We need to consider what we invest in. We need to consider where we make sacrifices, where we are willing to give up time, where we are willing to invest. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to make wise decisions, to be good stewards of our own lives to spend that time with you, to make you number one priority. So that, Lord, we could be filled and filled again with the Holy Spirit, that we might be filled with your word, that we might become everything that you desire of us. Lord, we are nothing without you, but with you, anything is possible. And we pray, Lord, that we would get excited about serving you, Lord, we sometimes have ambitions. We put time and effort and money into qualifications and careers, and that's great. But Lord, only one thing is really necessary, and that's serving you. And there's only one thing that we can take with us for eternity, and that's serving you. Lord and Father, help us to realize that investing in this world, even though it may be beneficial for a time, is temporary like buying shares in the Titanic. And at the time, it may seem a good idea, but in the long run, we'll realize what a waste it was. Help us to invest instead in your kingdom, the kingdom that does not pass away, the kingdom that will be eternal, the kingdom that has true rewards. And we pray, Lord, that we would, we would be a blessing to you, Lord. We want to do this for your glory. Not for ours, but for yours. For your name's sake. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.